Hey, what's up, everyone? This is your host, Pop Culture Junkie, back to share with you my spoilers, recaps, and results for the final pay review of the year from WWE, WWE's TLC 2018. This is, of course, the one night where they go full demolition derby with all types of wild matches involving tables, ladders, chairs, oh my, and more. So let's go ahead and get to the show. Our kickoff panel is uh, hosted by Coach, along with David Otunga, Sam Roberts, and Booker T. Uh, we get some back and forth talk on their predictions for what's going to take place later in the show as far as match results. We go backstage and we see JoJo practicing her announcement of Baron Corbin being the winner by forfeit because the rumor is that Braun Strowman will not make it to the match tonight and therefore Baron will win and become the permanent Raw GM. He says he has chosen Charlie Caruso who steps on screen to interview him after the match to ask him how it feels to become the permanent Raw GM. Caruso instead asks Corbin about the rumors that the Monster Among Men will still be here tonight. Corbin says even if Braun shows, he will destroy his good elbow. We go to the first matchup of the night on the kickoff show. Match number one is the WWE Cruiserweight title match, Buddy Murphy versus Cedric Alexander. After battling outside the ring, Cedric rolls Murphy back into the ring. Murphy pulls Cedric Alexander face first into the second turnbuckle, delivers a running knee to the face, followed by Murphy's Law, and gets the pin to retain. Great match. We go back to the panel for some more back and forth predictions and discussion. Next up, we go to the backstage for a interview with Becky Lynch. And she's interviewed saying, when was the last time SmackDown had the final match or the main event show? Or when was the last time you had a women's title match as the main event matchup? And really giving it a big teaser about maybe the possibility we will actually get the women's title match as a main event at WrestleMania. That would be awesome. Uh, but I loved her quote before she walked away from the interview saying, there's a lot of depth to be collected when the man comes around. Loved it. Okay, she's she's just doing awesome. We go back to the panel one more time, and then we go to ringside where Elias is inside the ring with his guitar, and another guitar is being uh, hung above him uh, because we are now going into our second matchup, which is Elias versus Bobby Lashley in a guitar on a pole match or ladder match. <laughs> it's basically a ladder match, but they didn't make it clear when they were... Uh, advertising this match it said it was going to be a ladder match and you have to climb the ladder to get the guitar and you can use it okay but they didn't specify does the match end when you get the guitar or just means you get to use the guitar and you still have to pin or submit your opponent anyway elias begins to sing a song but unfortunately of course leo rush and bobby lashley interrupt they come out and as they are walking to the ring leo does his usual trash talk Lashley even does his favorite pose where he bends over, smacking his ass. The matchup was not very long. It actually seemed like it was over in less than five minutes. To me, it did. Uh, Lashley goes for the guitar on the ladder. Elias hits a powerbomb on Lashley onto a ladder that was laying on the ground or laying in the uh, turnbuckle corner. Uh, Cole actually called it a spine buster when it was actually a powerbomb. Elias begins to climb the ladder, and so does Leo Rush on the other side. Elias headbutts Leo, and Rush falls to the ground. Elias then grabs the guitar, and the bell rings, signifying that he won the match. So all you had to do was grab the guitar, and you won the match. Okay? So Elias attempts to hit Lashley with the guitar, but Leo Rush jumps onto Elias' back, distracting Elias and allowing Bobby to connect a spine buster. Leo Rush then hits a frog splash and Lashley cracks the guitar over Elias's back and that's it. <laughs> All right, we kick off the pay-per-view with the Mix Match Challenge Finals. Fabulous Truth, R-Truth and Carmella versus Mahalisha of Jenner Mahal and Alicia Fox. The winner now, the winning team, the male and females win number 30 spots in their respective rumbles. So that's you know what you get if you win. And they announced earlier in the evening that the winners would also get a free trip of their choice anywhere. So the match itself was nothing wow. It, it really wasn't anything wow. Uh, in the end, uh, Alicia Fox and Carmella are trading pinning attempts. And finally, Carmella connects with the Kona Silence submission and makes Alicia tap out and... R-Truth and Carmella are your winners. Afterwards, they're interviewed in the ring, and they're questioned right then and there, where are they going to take their trip? R-Truth kind of milks it for a while, saying, hey, we're going to go somewhere tropical, somewhere amazing this, and uh, Carmella's trying to guess, like, oh, we're going to Rio de Janeiro, Paris, or somewhere like that, Rome. And he goes, no, we're going to WWE headquarters in Connecticut. <laughs> so I'm guessing on SmackDown, there's going to be some kind of, you know, segment uh, on location thing that they're going to do for... Uh, 
for a couple weeks there. Who knows? All right, our next matchup is the SmackDown Live Tag Team Title Triple Threat Match. The Bar defending against the Usos and the New Day. And the two competitors from the New Day will be Kofi Kingston and Xavier Woods. One of the highlights of the match for me was at one point Kofi Kingston goes for a flying body press onto Cesaro, but Cesaro catches him. He flips Kofi up into the air into a standing suplex, holds him there, and then Jimmy Uso comes off the same turnbuckle for a body press onto Kofi, and they all three land. Basically, Cesaro lands the suplex at the same time. It was a really good move, and once again, shows off the amazing strength of Cesaro. Uh, the match itself was great. There was a lot of good moments in the match, and again, we know that these three tag teams can always put on good matches. It's just that we've seen this over, over, and over all year, <laughs> and it's like, when do we get fresh tag team matchups and feuds and rivalries? Uh, so yeah, in the end, Sheamus connects with a bro kick to Xavier Woods and gets the pinfall, and the bar is still your SmackDown Live Tag Team Champions, which is what I was hoping for. I'm ready for the bar to have a fresh opponent. Our next matchup, we have the TLC match of Braun Strowman versus Baron Corbin. If Braun wins, he will get a universal title match against Brock Lesnar at the Royal Rumble. If Corbin wins, he will become the permanent Raw general manager. Corbin comes out along with Heath Slater, who is the referee for the match. He announces that... After a 10 count, he will be awarded by forfeit the victory and become the permanent Raw General Manager. So the bell rings. Heath Slater begins counting. One, two, three. Corbin counts along with them. Slater gets to seven, and then Braun's music hits. Here comes Braun Strowman with his right arm in a sling. He comes out, gets on the mic, says, Hey, TLC is a no-DQ match, which means anything goes. And if somebody wants to step in and help out or do something for me because he can't wrestle right now because he's still, you know, basically injured, uh, then nothing he can do about it. All of a sudden, Finn Balor, Apollo Crews, Chad Cable, and Bobby Roode appear surrounding the ring, all holding steel chairs. Corbin tells Slater to get them all out of there. Instead, Slater takes off his ref shirt, throws it at Corbin, then knocks Corbin down. The baby faces all pile into the ring, surrounding Corbin, holding the chairs, and one at a time, they each get to smack Corbin with the chair. Corbin rolls out of the ring, makes his way up the ramp like he's trying to leave. All of a sudden, Kurt Angle's music hits, and he comes out, grabs a chair that uh, nearby, smacks Corbin with the chair multiple times to get him to go back to the ring. Once Corbin's back inside the ring, uh, Rude and Gable connect with their finisher. Apollo Crews connects with a frog splash off the top rope. Angle hits an angle slam, and then finally Finn hits a coup de gras all on Corbin. Slater then puts on his ref shirt again. Strowman comes into the ring, puts one foot on top of Corbin's chest. Slater makes the one, two, three, and Braun Strowman is your winner. So we didn't get a TLC match out of this, uh, but we did get uh, five baby faces beating up one heel <laughs> uh, with chairs. Uh, different. I mean, I understand, again, Strowman's injured and such. Uh, could they have substituted somebody else? Could they have just scrapped the match and done something else? Yeah, there's a lot of things they could have done, uh, but this is the route they went with. So share your thoughts. Let me know what you think about that. Uh, but to me, it seemed like it was very drawn out. It seemed like it could have been condensed a lot more, but I get they're trying to make up time because this match probably would have been at least a uh, 12 to 15 minute matchup at least. So our next matchup is the tables match, Ruby Riot versus Natalia. I've not been a big fan of this feud because I don't like how they've included the real-life passing of Natalia's father, Jim Diablo Neidhart. So Riot Squad, they come out to the ring after Natalia makes her entrance, but the Riot Squad brings out the table that we saw on Raw with Jim Diablo Neidhart's photo on it. Early in the match, Natalia goes for a spear on Ruby, but she moves out of the way, and Natalia ends up running into Liv Morgan, who was on the ring apron, and Morgan goes backwards off the apron through a table. Later on, Natalia and Ruby are battling outside the ring again, and Sarah Logan tries to interfere, uh, but she ends up getting body slammed through another table by Natalia. Ruby Riot sets up the Jim Neville Neidhart photoed table in the corner. Natalia applies the sharpshooter on Ruby, and it's where Ruby's facing the, cor the corner, uh, facing the table. Riot is able to reach over and enough just to pull the table backwards and is able to connect it to the back of Natalia, breaking up the hole. Natalia then pulls out another table from under the ring, and it's got Ruby Riot's photo on it. And she also pulls out Jimmy Apple Neihardt's jacket that's underneath the, uh, the ring as well. Uh, so she puts the jacket on, and she wears his jacket for the remainder of the match. So they set up the table in a uh, corner of the ring, and uh, Natalia gets on the top rope. It seemed like she was going to attempt some kind of moonsault, but Ruby rolls off the table and uh, prevents her from doing anything. She climbs up like she's going to attempt a Hurricane Rana, but Natalia catches Ruby, holds onto her, stands up on the second turnbuckle, and delivers a powerbomb through the table, gets the victory, one, two, three, 
Natalia is your winner. That was a really good match. Our next matchup, we have Drew McIntyre versus Finn Balor. Great matchup, but it wasn't anything more spectacular than what you've normally seen on Monday Night Raw. After fighting outside the ring, Drew rolls Finn back inside the ring, and Dolph Ziggler shows up out of nowhere with a sweet chin music. He grabs a steel chair, but before he can do anything else, Drew kicks the chair right into Dolph's face. Uh, basically, no selling the chin music entirely. Uh, Drew brings in the chair, but Finn drop kicks the chair into Drew, hits the coup de gras, and pins McIntyre. That was a shock. Next up, we have a chairs match. Rey Mysterio versus Randy Orton. There are literally dozens of steel chairs lined up all around the ring into the aisle. Uh, so we definitely know they're going to be using a lot of chairs. And that's exactly what we got. Lots of chair uh, shots from Randy uh, or from Rey Mysterio early on. Uh, Rey Mysterio, of course, I mean, looking at the two competitors, it's like Randy Orton should be able to squash Rey Mysterio in a heartbeat. And this is, you know, you have a super heavyweight versus a cruiserweight. And, yeah, he's throwing Rey Mysterio around like he's nothing. I mean, compared to him, he weighs like 50 pounds. It's, it's ridiculous. But we get a lot of back and forth and a lot of moments where you think, any moment now, Rey's going to get the win, but then Orton just makes a comeback. Uh, finally, we have Rey Mysterio tied up in the corner. He <laughs> He's sitting on the top turnbuckle, and there's a steel chair that's been wedged between the top turnbuckle and the second turnbuckle uh, by Orton earlier. And this was like the worst move for me where... Randy just grabs Mysterio by the mask and just pulls him downward where he flips forward but doesn't flip off of the turnbuckle like you normally would. He just goes face first to the chair. So Orton sets up four steel chairs side by side and is attempting to do an RKO, but Ray somehow gets out of the move. He trips up Randy into sitting on the chair, connects with a Hurricane Rana off the chair and rolls him up into a pinfall and gets the win. That's it. Our next matchup is the Raw Women's title match, Ronda Rousey versus Nia Jax with Tamina at ringside. Now, this match was uh, a rematch, basically, from, what, Money in the Bank earlier this year is when they had their first matchup, and that was where Nia was the champ, and she challenged Ronda on the red carpet of some award ceremony or something like that. And uh, this matchup was a lot better. I enjoyed this one a lot better than their Money in the Bank match. And uh, it's a nice back-and-forth moments. Ronda, again, is easily... Rookie of the Year, Salesperson of the Year when it comes to how great she's done for her first year in the business. It's amazing. Uh, she's picked it up so well, and I'm a fan. And I can't help but say, again, she has picked it up so fast. She knows exactly what she's doing in the ring. It's it's in, it's very impressive. Uh, so the match was going fine, back and forth moments. A lot of attempts by uh, Ronda to get a, a submission on uh, Nia Jax. Nia Jax, of course, uh, the bigger of the two, obviously. Uh, so her size came into play for different ways. But Ronda had no trouble taking Nia to the mat several times, which was impressive. Uh, so later on, Tamina attempts to interfere, but Ronda waved her off. Nia attacks from behind and tries to punch Ronda. They're really playing up that whole you know face breaker, hashtag face breaker thing. Uh, Ronda blocks the punch, applies the armbar, and Nia taps out. Still your women's champion, Ronda Rousey. We go backstage for an interview with AJ Styles to uh, prepare him for his matchup to challenge Dana Bryan to regain the WWE Championship. So our next match is the WWE title match. AJ Styles challenging Dana Bryan, the champion. Uh, Dana Bryan comes out, does not do the yes movement chants, anything like that, just comes out. Uh, the match starts off with him doing little sprints or jogging things around the ring, similar to what he did at Survivor Series when he was uh, fighting Brock, uh, where he kind of taunted him from the outside. Now, this match was really good. It was very good. And these are two of the greatest in-ring performers of our generation, obviously. And they put on a great match. Now, was it the best match it could have been? I don't think it was. I think they held back, and maybe they're going to have another rematch or two, something like that. But... To me, it just felt like there was that one little extra something missing. And the ending of the match kind of came out of nowhere. There was lots of back and forth moments. You had uh, lots of times where you had Daniel Bryan trying to put the yes lock. Then you had AJ. Uh, there was a really nice move where he, uh, he rolled through a roll-up attempt and got him right, got uh, Daniel Bryan set up perfect for the Styles Clash, but he just couldn't lock his legs around his arms. Uh, but if he had rolled through it and connected with the Styles Clash, that would have been an awesome series of moves right there. So in the end, AJ Styles goes for a small package, and the ref counts one, two. Daniel ends up shifting the weight and rolls on top. Referee counts one, two, three, and that's your victory. Uh, it kind of came out of nowhere, okay? There wasn't a, a big uh, 
signature move or fin finishing maneuver to lead up to that. It was just a small package out of nowhere. Kind of remind me a little bit of WrestleMania 3, Savage versus Macho Man, where the small package was the uh, deciding pin, and it kind of came out of nowhere as well. So, very good match, though. Not, no complaints at all. Our next matchup is the WWE Intercontinental title match, Seth Rollins defending against Dean Ambrose. And this match was very surprising because it was very lackluster in, in a lot of ways. Uh, these are two guys that know each other very well, that can definitely put on great matches, and they've had better matches in the past, but this one was not one of them. Uh, it, had, it just seemed like it dragged, and it may have been the place on the card, because we already had uh, 10 matches ahead of this uh, that followed AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan. That's a tough act to follow, and basically it was the come down match before the main event, so... You think back 10 plus years ago, this was what the Divas matches were, okay? They put this uh, spot f perfectly for Diva matches to have just a three-minute, four-minute match, and this one went a little longer, obviously. In the end, Seth Rollins goes to attack Dean Ambrose, and Dean Ambrose connects with Dirty Deeds, and he gets a clean pinfall, one, two, three, which was surprising, okay? You got two heels in a row, Dan Bryan and Dean Ambrose, clean pinfalls, Interesting. Interesting choices. That leads us to the finale, the final, the main event. That's right. This is the final match of the night. It is the main event of the show. It is the TLC first time ever women's tables, ladders, and chairs match, triple threat match. Becky Lynch, the man defending against the Queen, Charlotte Flair, and the Empress of Tomorrow, Asuka. And this match was incredible. I loved this match. Lots of great spots, lots of good moments, lots of good drama. I mean, I, I predicted that the three participants were going to say backstage, hey, you know what, let's go out there and do any and everything we possibly can do to steal the show, to put on the match of our, of our lifetime here. And you know what, don't hold back, we'll apologize afterwards. And it clearly looked like it because they did not hold back. Uh, we had tables, chairs, ladders, kendo sticks, uh, broken tables galore. There was a spot where Charlotte is on the ladder trying to climb up to the get to, uh, to the uh, title belt. Oscar steps in between her legs to set her up for a power bomb. Uh, she goes to power bomb her through the a table that's laid in the corner, and the distance wasn't right, and it's hard to see around your opponent when you have their you know stomach and everything in your face. Uh, but she, uh, Asuka sh uh, dropped her a little short to where she, ba like, Charlotte basically landed on the last, like, six inches of the, the bottom of the table. Like, the whole table is still standing, but just the bottom part is bent from her landing on it. So th that looked nasty. Uh, as soon as she hit, Charlotte rolled over to the side and was uh, clutching the back of her head because I know she smacked her head right on the back of that table. Uh, that was a, a hard shot right there. Later on, outside the ring, Becky Lynch delivers a, basically a plancha. It looked like she was doing some kind of leg drop, but she delivered a uh, plancha off the top of one of the really tall, like, 15-foot ladders and uh, landed on Charlotte's sternum through the announce table. <laughs> that was another hard hit. Uh, later on, we have Asuka standing next to the ring announcer barricade, and she had just been wailing away on both opponents with a kendo stick. And out of nowhere, Charlotte comes and spears her into the barricade, but the barricade does not go all the way down like normally. Normally, when they spear somebody through there, it goes all the way to the ground, and they roll into where, like, JoJo and the, the timekeeper are sitting. No, that barricade went about five inches in, and that's it. So uh, Charlotte just slammed into Asuka and flattened her against that wall. That looked brutal, too. All right, so then we have Charlotte setting up a table outside the ring near the other announced tables. She lays Becky Lynch on it, gets on the top rope, does a moon, uh, does a somersault flip onto Becky, crashing through the table. Asuka gets in the ring, goes up the ladder, tries to get to the belt. Charlotte is able to get to her feet in time to get in there, climb up to the ladder, and prevent Asuka at the same time, Becky Lynch brings in another ladder, sets it up next to them. At this time, Asuka gets knocked off. Charlotte climbs over to the ladder that Becky was setting up, and they're battling at the top back and forth. At this moment, all of a sudden, here comes Ronda Rousey down the aisle. She gets in the ring, goes underneath the first ladder, pushes the ladder that Charlotte and Becky are on over. They fall to the ground, roll out to the ring. Just then... Asuka comes back in, she climbs the ladder, gets to the top, 
retrieves the title belt, and she is your brand new SmackDown Women's Champion. Yes, the ear, yes, the Empress of Tomorrow has now become a champion. Finally, okay, she has won the championship. Okay, we're ending the year on a good note. Okay, just let her keep the title for a while, though. I want Asuka to have a solid women's championship title reign undefeated reign let her be champion for a year i don't care just she needs to just you know be annihilating opponents left and right forget about the whole oh she doesn't speak very good english who cares she is a amazing competitor she speaks more with her character through her wrestling than she needs to speak on a microphone that's that's all i can say about that so yeah Asuka is your winner. She is your new women's champion. Uh, the pay-per-view ends with her standing atop the ladder, still holding the title, shaking and smiling, so happy and excited. So awesome ending to the show. And it definitely helped because, again, the match before this, the Intercontinental title match, uh, it was, you know, I'm glad Dean Ambrose won the title. I'm glad he's Intercontinental champion. I got kind of burnt out on Seth Rollins being champion. But that match did have a lot of lull in it and even the audience was chanting this is boring this is boring so the women definitely had a lot to have to worry about going into their final match here uh because they're like hey the audience is getting burnt out they've already seen 11 matches and the last one got boring chance what are we going to do and they they turned it up a notch and they delivered so fantastic so i definitely enjoyed this pay review what would i rate this one i'm going to give this one an a solid eight so we say maybe we want a B plus, A minus maybe B plus is what I'm gonna say that. Uh, best match of the night for me, triple threat, TLC match, Ronda, Oscar, Charlotte, and the ending was amazing. So yes, uh, that's match of the night for me. Uh, close second would be Daniel Bryan versus uh, AJ Styles. Also great match. Uh, worst match of the night for my opinion. It's a toss-up, but I have to say it's either going to be the uh, Strowman-Corbin stuff, which really wasn't a match, but that was just, uh, uh, but I'd say as far as an actual match, worst match of the night for me, chairs match, Raven Mysterio versus Orton, uh, they really seemed like they were going through the motions, didn't really do a whole lot to put on a great match, and uh, yeah, the chair match concept is just, you know, it's confusing to me, I don't know, I don't understand it. So I, I enjoyed the show, it was a great pay-per-view, and uh, I hope everyone out there that got to watch enjoyed the show as well. Uh, share with me as always. Let me know your comments below. Uh, what did you think? Best match of the night? What was your favorite match? Uh, what do you think they're going to do from here? Obviously, we're setting up uh, the road to WrestleMania. The next pay-per-view is the Royal Rumble. So we know they're they're leaning towards Becky Lynch and Ronda. Obviously, that you know segment at the end of the uh, TLC match tonight, they're going to do something to where Becky challenges Ronda for the title since Ronda still has her belt. Becky lost her title, but... Becky lost it because somebody interfered, and she never got pinned. She never submitted. You know, it's a ladder match, so she didn't actually lose the title by losing. She just couldn't get to the belt in time because also she got, you know, interference. So uh, Becky Lynch has saved a lot of, you know, credit here. So she's she's safe, and her momentum is still strong. So they're going to definitely lead to probably Becky Lynch winning the Royal Rumble for the women's and then challenge Ronda. That's at least my prediction there. So we will see what happens or what they decide to go. All right, everyone. Thanks as always for listening. I hope you enjoyed this spoilers recap and results. Remember as always to follow along with me on Twitter at Pop Culture Junk Two, where I'm always live tweeting during every WWE pay review and takeover and network special and so forth. Well, until next time, I hope you'll tune in again. But until then, this is the Pop Culture Junkie, and I am signing out. Pop culture.